It's a great honor to uh, welcome uh, Alicia Quizno to give us a talk on otopathology uh, insights from human temporal bone regarding otosclerosis. Uh, she is an assistant professor at uh, Harvard and also an instructor, has an active research interest in histopathology, working in the histopathology lab there at Mass Pioneer. So thank you for joining us. Welcome. And we're looking forward to hearing you from you. Well, thank you very much. Um, an honor to talk to this group who um, no doubt only can, can teach us all a lot about otopathology for the stapedectomy surgeon as well. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and thank you also, especially to, to Dr. Hussein Mohabi for, um, or maybe I'm mispronouncing him, I apologize, Mohabi for uh, inviting me and coordinating all this. I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, so hopefully this uh, lecture will point out some clinical pearls that may be relevant uh, to you um, as fellows um, who take care of otosclerosis patients and performing stapedectomy surgery. Oh. Advance, okay. These are my conflicts of interest, uh, but I don't think any are directly related. And um, as an overview today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, temporal bone pathology um, in terms of how, uh, how, how we see the role of temporal bone pathology for otosclerosis. And then I'll talk to you about some various subtopics as you see here, ranging from pathophysiology to far advanced otosclerosis, um, and hopefully tie in some clinical pearls as we go. So, this particular group probably needs no specific introduction to this, but um, just to say a few words about human temporal bone pathology. I, this is obviously a very old science in that it started many decades ago um, with many um, temporal bone pathology labs all around the world. And um, I think today it still continues to play a very relevant role in um, hearing science and also in the study, particularly uh, as otologists of conditions that we may treat surgically or medically. I think it has particular value in understanding the um, outcomes of our actions as surgeons, and hopefully we'll review some of that with the pathology slides I show today. Um, and I think it also allows us to answer new questions that continue to arise related to either hearing science or uh, again, relating to post-surgical pathology. So, um, I don't know how familiar all of the fellows are with these tools and instruments. Um, perhaps you've harvested some temporal bones at this point, um, but as you know, there's a national registry to coordinate um, prospective enrollment of patients and upon um, death of patients wishing to uh, enroll, there's a coordinated effort to go and retrieve the temporal bones. And they can be retrieved either through an intracranial uh, plug or an extracranial process. Um, and what you see down here is a soloidin block before it's being sectioned. And pretty standardly, most temporal bone labs section those at about 20 microns, usually in an axial plane, although they can also be sectioned in a, in a vertical plane, um, depending on which anatomical uh, structures are of most interest. And so here you see the typical uh, horizontal sectioning plane um, that would go uh, through the lateral canal and through the, the mid section of the cochlea. So I mentioned a little bit about this um, earlier. I think as surgeons, it's particularly important. I think this is a important part of your education also as a, as a neurotologist. Um, uh, but also, you know, human temporal bone pathology is used for validating um, some things that we find out from animal studies. So validating animal studies, sometimes there are differences, of course, between human pathology and animal pathology. And certainly as we start to embark in this new um, era where we probably will see um, multiple different um, either small molecules or, or genetic treatments for types of sensorial hearing loss, I think it will play a special role in terms of how we understand who are the best candidates, uh, who are the best human candidates um, for these types of treatments. So this group is certainly familiar um, with otosclerosis. We know it's a disease of abnormal bony remodeling in the otic capsule. Um, that it typically results in a conductive hearing loss. And I'm showing here the, certainly the most classic type of audiogram you see here with the Carhartt notch uh, with the elevated bone thresholds ranging from uh, typically five to 15 decibels um, from the 500 to 4,000 Hertz range. Uh, but rarely it can result in a mixed hearing loss and even more rarely in a sensorial hearing loss. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
And as you know, uh, the uh, beginning uh, evaluation of otosclerosis certainly starts with an examination. And so you're looking for a normal eardrum and a tuning fork examination is um, very critical in these patients. Um, an audiogram with tympanometry. And um, in, in my practice, and I'm sure in many otologists, uh, we, we routinely do acoustic reflexes. And that's to be sure that the um, air bone gap that you're seeing is indeed a true conductive hearing loss rather than a pseudo conductive hearing loss, such as what might be seen in a third window syndrome like a superior semicircular canal dehiscence. And I put on here something that uh, could be considered controversial here, consider a CT scan. Certainly um, that is not uh, necessary um, in, in every patient with otosclerosis and certainly could be um, argued that it that is really not needed uh, before a surgery. Um, in my practice, though, it has changed over the uh, last, I guess, nine years uh, since embarking a, a, in my practice um, in that I do get CT scans frequently for patients who are, I'm going to take to the operating room uh, because we do rarely find additional um, causes of conductive hearing loss. Uh, that rate is probably around one or two percent, so it's admittedly quite low. And also because some of these patients ultimately become candidates for other treatments for which we're interested in looking at the extent of the disease around the otic capsule. And so it provides some information from that standpoint. Um, and so I just put on here the list of management. Certainly we always talk about observation hearing aid and stapedectomy, but of course some of these patients will fall into the cochlear implant range if they develop very advanced otosclerosis. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about medical management. And then just to clarify a few uh, terminology pieces, um, there's some, I think, confusion in how we discuss uh, the terms of cochlear otosclerosis, um, but, but generally in terms of defining it, we think about clinical otosclerosis as patients who have a conductive hearing loss, and so they presumably have a fixed stapes. Cochlear otosclerosis usually refers to patients who have a sensorineural hearing loss due to uh, otosclerosis surrounding the cochlea. And then of course there's histologic otosclerosis, which we're gonna see plenty of during this lecture. And that's um, patients who um, have, are, are deceased and we've been able to look at their temporal bones and they have evidence of otosclerosis on histology, but did not necessarily have enough um, conductive hearing loss or other hearing loss to be diagnosed during life. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about pathophysiology um, and also, I, I guess I would just say to any of the fellows, you're welcome to stop me throughout and answer, ask questions. Um, I don't know if I can see the chat, but uh, feel free to chime in if there are questions that come up. So I think um, in otosclerosis, maybe more than even any other disease has a long history with otopathology. Otopathology was um, obviously critical to understanding what was happening with otosclerosis. And, um, Back in the 1700s, uh, it was first discovered by Valsalva that otosclerosis was a condition of stapes fixation that was, that was causing hearing loss. It was not yet termed otosclerosis at the time, and it was thought to be actually due to a chronic inflammatory condition that was often referred to as a dry catarrh uh, of the middle ear that had caused stapes fixation. And it wasn't until about 200 years later uh, when Adam Pollitzer coined this term and identified that it was actually a bony condition, so a condition of the bony otic capsule that was causing um, fixation. And so this is a very classic image of otosclerosis. This is a axillary section temporal bone just with standard H&E staining. Um, you recognize the internal auditory canal, the cochlea, the middle ear. I assume you can see my arrow here. Um, and the stapes, of course, and it's fixed uh, anteriorly by this um, focus of otosclerosis. So otosclerosis is really a disease of bony remodeling. And I think we have some other higher power views here. Yep. And so this is a more magnified view of that same area. And here is the stapes uh, crora, and you can see fixation by this otosclerotic focus, which is here. And what happens pathologically with otosclerosis is that there is a resorption process of the normal otic capsule bone. And normally this is inhibited um, biochemically around the otic capsule, which is not supposed to turn over or remodel. And so in otosclerosis, when it begins to remodel, you get resorption of bone around these vascular spaces and you get enlargement of perivascular spaces, um, sometimes referred to as pseudovascular spaces and deposition of connective tissue and also of um, woven bone, which doesn't have that 
lamellar structure. Um, and as an otosclerotic lesion progresses, uh, that's often replaced by the more lamellar structure and it progresses from something that's originally referred to as otospongiosis with all these vascular spaces and, and woven bone to otosclerosis, which uh, generally refers to a more hardened form where there's more lamellar bone that's been deposited. And this spongiotic bone tends to take up more space and so it's somewhat expansile and um, you can get bone that extends, of course, across the stapedo vestibular ligament and, and causing fixation there. This is an example of what happens early on um, in otosclerosis. This is uh, referred to as jamming um, of the foot plate. And so what happens with jamming of the foot plate is this um, concept that I was just talking about where you can get some expansion perhaps of an anterior otosclerotic focus. And as that expands, it um, decreases the space in that stapedo vestibular ligament and um, comes into contact with the crura uh, of the foot plate and often causes the, the posterior crura of the foot plate to become jammed or impacted here at the posterior aspect of where there should be that stapedo vestibular ligament. And so in this condition, this patient is likely to have a, a mild or small amount of a small air bone gap or a mild conductive hearing loss. Um, and, and this is really, you know, what we're using the tuning fork for, of course, is to see um, when there's enough conductive hearing loss that presumably the foot plate is more fixed. So this, if I had to guess uh, what this patient had would be less than 25 decibels of, of conductive hearing loss. Um, but in this condition, it could be potentially more tricky to do a st uh, stapedectomy because the foot plate is not really fixed. And so it would be potentially predisposed to um, avulsing the entire stapes when you try to down fracture that, or it would be difficult to potentially drill um, on the foot plate in this because putting some pressure could, could dislocate that. Um, and certainly that could be managed in the operating room, but, um, but these are the early stages of otosclerosis. And so this is generally why we wait um, until there's some progression of, of the hearing loss because it likely signals more fixation of the, the foot plate um, and perhaps an, an easier surgery because of that. So there are multiple sites of predilection for otosclerosis around the otic capsule. Um, certainly the most common location is the area of the anterior crura uh, at the otic capsule. And um, that is affected in 97% of patients uh, when you look at histologic slides that have otosclerosis. So that's almost always the site uh, that, that's first uh, affected. Um, however, about 50% of temporal bone specimens do have additional otosclerotic lesions, either around the otic capsule, at the round window, which is not shown in this plane, um, posterior, at the posterior aspect of the, the foot plate, or even around the internal auditory canal. So um, about 50% have some otosclerosis around the round window, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. That has some implications for how we think about um, stapedectomy, especially in cases where there could be um, um, complete obstruction of the round window. And only about um, 10 to 20 percent have some otosclerosis around the otic capsule. This area here has been studied quite a bit um, in the last five years, I would say, uh, with regard to what, is it, what does it mean uh, for patients with otosclerosis. Um, this is an area at the anterior portion of the internal auditory canal. Uh, and it's sometimes referred to as a diverticulum or an outpouching. Um, at Mass Ioneer, we have referred to it as the apple bite sign. Um, but uh, there have been a couple of papers now, including um, one from your group, uh, from Dr. Miller, and um, a couple of radiologic papers looking at what the significance of this is. It is certainly more common in patients with otosclerosis, this anterior IAC cavitation. But interestingly, there are other reasons for um, IAC anterior cavitations uh, in patients that don't have any other um, otologic condition. And so um, large cavitations are often associated with otosclerosis. And as you can see in this slide, there is some otosclerotic bone around here. And so that's likely the reason for this actual cavitation versus there are certainly um, actually a large number of cases that have cavitary lesions in that area, but do not have any associated otosclerosis. So um, we have learned over the past number of years that it is um, suggestive of otosclerosis, for example, if you see that on a CT scan, but certainly not pathognomonic for it. 
And then there can be multiple grades of otosclerosis. We talked a little bit about the pathophysiology and the evolution of the otosclerotic plaques um, through, a, through a phase of spongiosis, um, oftentimes through a mixed phase and through a sclerotic phase. And oftentimes they're actually present in the same temporal bone. And so um, this is one such example. This is a different case uh, in which you can see there's an area of very active uh, otospongiosis um, here, an area uh, of mixed activity, and then more dense areas of otosclerosis surrounding the otic capsule here. Um, and the importance of this may have a role as we start to think about uh, what happens with potentially medical treatments of otosclerosis in terms of trying to monitor whether or not um, there are actual changes in response to medical treatments. If we can actually measure these on a CT scan, for example, um, if we can tell that there are areas of activity that become then inactive, that could be a potential way to um, monitor disease treatment. So this is an area of very active uh, otosclerosis, and um, this is really the hallmarks of this are really these very large pseudovascular spaces, as you see here. And oftentimes you can actually find these multinucleated osteoclasts uh, that are actually um, live osteoclasts at the, at the front or at the edge of a very active lesion versus the um, inactive areas oftentimes have these empty lacuna where there are no living uh, osteoclasts there. So just moving on to a few questions that can be answered. I put this study up here. This was a, a nice study. It was a, a multi, um, multi-site study, including the house group and the Minnesota group. And this is just an example, I think, of how some questions continue to arise in terms of pathophysiology that are still um, most easily answered by uh, otopathology. And so in, a few years ago, there was a um, a group that had been discussing this concept of non-otosclerotic stapes fixation and had identified that there may be some patients in which um, they had stapes fixation and underwent successful stapedectomies, but they did not think they actually had otosclerosis, um, particularly because these cases did not segregate with, um, with um, having evidence of potential measles infection. And so there was a proposal that maybe there was a whole other separate uh, entity pathologically that was causing stapes fixation. So we decided to um, do a collaborative project looking back at a number of um, post-stapedectomy specimens. And um, luckily, the, there are a good number of otosclerosis and post-stapedectomy specimens um, in all three of the, the mass INEAR and the house and the uh, Minnesota group's uh, laboratories. So we were able to look at a number of those and um, did find that indeed most of the stapedectomies that are done are certainly um, all due to otosclerosis. And so during life, of course, when we take that stapes specimens out, um, in our institution, we typically send it for pathology, but uh, it's really for gross only. And I'm honestly not sure what the, what the real value of that is. We're not looking pathologically, but um, but when we remove that specimen, we're not removing any part of the otic capsule. And so there really isn't any way to necessarily prove during life that those patients had otosclerosis. They of course do have um, some visual evidence. So, you know, when you're doing a stapedectomy surgery, you can usually see that the, the bone um, oftentimes anterior to the foot plate has this very white and hardened appearance. And so there's typically a very visual, um, there's a visual distinction that looks like otosclerosis, but we don't usually get any any pathologic confirmation of that necessarily. Um, but when we go back and look at temporal bones, we can of course look at uh, sections through the otic capsule and um, can understand in patients who had stapedectomy whether or not they had otosclerosis. And so we did find in this study that 99% of these specimens had otosclerosis. 1% um, of the specimens that had a stapedectomy did not have otosclerosis, but interestingly, um, one of these actually had otosclerosis in the other temporal bone and the other had this, um, other um, perhaps raised this question of having isolated foot plate otosclerosis. So once in a while, there are cases in which the otosclerosis only involves the foot plate. And again, that would be very rare, but that the fixation comes from involvement of the foot plate that expands, expands outwards and then causes fixation of the stapes that way rather than from an area in the, in the anterior portion of the otic capsule. Um, so the conclusion there was that um, we did not think that there was any separate pathologic entity. So a nice example of how pathology can still clarify ongoing questions. 
So the next uh, topic I wanted to talk a little bit about is sensorineural hearing loss and otosclerosis. Um, what we know from pathologic specimens, um, and this is work uh, really done by Fred Linthicum as well as um, Joan Adol many years ago, is that um, that patients who have uh, have otosclerosis around the cochlea, so surrounding the cochlea and involving the otic capsule, um, in which the otosclerosis actually extends uh, to the spiral ligament or what might be called the cochlear endosteum, so the soft tissue areas of the of the cochlea actually develop this um, deposition of an eosinophilic dense material called hyaline. And this deposits in the spiral ligament, as you can see here. And so this is a picture of a very spongiotic otosclerotic plaque, and it has involved the entire endosteal layer. And then you can see adjacent to that, this pink hyaline material that deposits there. Um, and so patients who, uh, in, the, in the temporal bone laboratory uh, specimens, patients who had um, a significant component of sensorineural hearing loss, now they oftentimes have mixed rather than pure hearing loss, they of, oftentimes also have a stabes fixation, but those who have a sensorineural component of hearing loss um, were more likely to have had this hyaline desp deposition um, with, with uh, involvement of the endosteal layer. And so, um, so this is something that is pathologically associated with the onset of sensorineural hearing loss. Um, there have been a number of studies, um, uh, a lot from the house group, in fact, looking at uh, what is the cause of this hyaline deposition. Um, there was a nice proteomic study um, that came from the house group that identified actually when you look at specimens that have a lot of this hyaline deposition that there is a lot of transforming growth factor beta one in these specimens. And so it highlights the potential role of inflammation in these specimens. Um, so there's still more work I think to be done in terms of understanding more about what's causing the sensorineural hearing loss. But um, what we know from conventional techniques, interestingly, is that there is not a whole lot of spiral ganglion neuron loss or hair cell loss. And so it's not the downstream neural elements, at least um, with our conventional techniques that, that are degenerated in otosclerosis but really the, the pathologic change um, that's more obvious certainly is this hyaline deposition um, in the spiral ligament and certainly understanding that the spiral ligament is perhaps a misnomer it is, as it is certainly not just a ligament, it um, has some role in cochlear homeostasis. Um, that has been uh, one of the leading theories about what is causing sensorineural hearing loss. Um, but I think this is an active area of ongoing investigation and um, we will plan to explore that further in terms of other causes of sensorineural hearing loss in these patients. So one question that this brings up is how common is sensorineural hearing loss in otosclerosis? We were talking about, and when, I, when I'm talking about sensorineural hearing loss here, I'm talking about patients who have some component of sensorineural hearing loss. We know that um, pure cochlear otosclerosis where there's a pure sensorineural hearing loss is in fact extremely rare. Um, there's certainly a number of published cases on it, but, um, but it's actually extremely rare. And in the mass eye and ear collection, out of um, hundreds of, of cases of otosclerosis, uh, I think there are only two that have um, otosclerosis without real stapes fixation. So pure otosclerosis, pure sensorineural hearing loss would, would of course be very rare. But here we're talking about having any sensorineural component of hearing loss. Um, and so we did a study um, a few years ago where we looked back at um, all of the otosclerosis cases that we could pull through our, our charting program. And we were interested in looking at long-term follow-up. And so we looked only at patients who had 10 years or more of follow-up. Of course, there's a lot of drop-off because um, hopefully when patients are doing well is why, but they, they don't always come back for their follow-up uh, hearing tests. Um, but in this cohort of of patients who did have long-term follow-up over 10 years. We looked at um, patients who were both operated and non-operated um, and ended up with a study cohort of 357 years. We um, excluded patients who had um, some hearing loss that might have been due to the, the surgery itself. So patients who had elevations in their bone thresholds afterwards were excluded and we, we did use pretty strict criteria for that. Um, but we were interested in looking at how often this was happening and to what degree this was happening. So um, what we found is that, um, you know, when you look over this 10 year period and the, the average age of these patients ranged from in the 50s uh, to the mid 60s by the end of the study period. 
um, is that these patients do develop uh, oftentimes more hearing loss than expected for age alone. Um, so there are certainly some outliers who develop a whole lot of uh, sense and neural component of hearing loss, but even when you look on averages, these patients do develop um, more hearing loss than expected for age alone. And so in this study, we actually subtracted uh, what would be expected or predicted for age-related hearing loss uh, based on the um, ISO 7, 7029 uh, values for eight predicted age-related hearing loss. And, um, and so looking at the different frequencies, we found that um, on average, if you look at all patients, it ranges between six to nine decibels of hearing loss. So it's not a whole lot when you look at averages, um, but when you look at a subset of patients, uh, that might have what we would call clinically significant sensorineural hearing loss, um, and that we defined as two or more frequencies having um, 15 decibels of hearing loss or more, so something that's really more clinically um, significant. It turns out about a third of our patients ended up having some progression of sensorineural hearing loss that were, was, again, more than expected for age alone. Um, and interestingly, when you look uh, at this subset um, that was more likely to be women, and um, interestingly, I think for reasons that we can't quite explain, and there may be some other emerging theories on this, but uh, not entirely explained, is that patients who had had a stapedectomy actually had a little less of this progressive sense neural hearing loss over the 10-year follow-up. So um, we talked a little bit about this already, this, um, this concept of uh, looking for hyalinization as the cause of sense neural hearing loss. Um, and um, that when the, the cochlear otosclerosis really does not reach the end ostium, that uh, oftentimes these patients don't actually have sense neural hearing loss. Um, but that, that, that may be you know, some of the pathology, I think that's still being worked out in terms of what is actually causing that in these patients. So thinking about um, treatment, and perhaps the reason why this is important is of course, we wanna do better for our patients and see um, if there are other treatments that may be effective beyond surgery. Surgery, of course, only addresses the conductive loss. So, um, looking at addressing uh, the sensor neural component, um, there have been multiple medications that have tri been tried over the years. Um, sodium fluoride was once very popular for treatment of otosclerosis. Um, and in our practice, um, we have been using uh, bisphosphonates for a selected group of patients that have um, demonstrated um, progressive sensor neural component of hearing loss over years uh, in hopes of slowing down this progression. And so in our practice, we um, do use for these patients uh, typically either resedronate or zoledronate, um, and that would be done in conjunction with a um, either rheumatologist or endocrinologist for very selected patients. So this is some of the, the what I would call probably limited data that we have looking retrospectively at our um, experience here with treatment. This. Um, really um, started with Mike McKenna and his interest in treating these patients with um, bisphosphonates. So many of these are his patients. Um, and um, what we did is look back retrospectively at, at patients who had been treated with bisphosphonates. And again, this is a selected group that had documented progression um, before treatment. And we were interested in looking at whether or not their progressive uh, sensorineural hearing loss leveled out or plateaued with treatment. Um, and what we found was that for the majority of patients, it did. So um, these graphs are, are showing uh, pretreatment bone conduction. And again, we're just looking at bone conduction uh, because we're looking at that sense neural component of hearing loss um, versus post-treatment on the y-axis here. And the shaded uh, area represents no change. So that would represent stabilization. And so most patients um, were in the uh, stabilized group uh, after treatment. And um, the same was true when you look at word recognition, again, pre-treatment on the x-axis and post-treatment on the y-axis there. So moving on, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, radiologic and histologic correlations in otosclerosis. And, and again, certainly this is not um, necessary for patients undergoing um, for patients undergoing surgery, but it may add to the clinical diagnosis. Um, and again, it may add to our understanding of the extent of the disease. For these patients I was just talking to you about, um, all of these patients receive a CT scan before deciding if they would be candidates for a bisphosphonate treatment. And, um, and we only treat patients who have um, who have a clinical, have, have, have a radiologic evidence of otosclerosis around the cochlea 
in that the presumed pathology is what we were just talking about with involvement of the endosteum um, and sensorineural hearing loss from that mechanism. So it, it is part of our algorithm for patients who have a mixed hearing loss and that's progressive. So this is um, a picture of one of our temporal bone specimens. So we can learn a lot from our temporal bone specimens um, in terms of radiologic histologic correlations and otosclerosis because we are doing um, CT scans on the specimen itself. Um, and this occurs uh, after fixation, um, but um, it, it, it requires a special bowl here, which is non-metallic uh, that can go through the CT scan without artifact. And, um, and now uh, for the past num for a past number of years, we've been doing CT scans on all these specimens so that we can do some of these uh, correlative studies. Um, and so this was a study that we did looking at this question of how often can we predict accurately that, uh, that there's otosclerosis in a patient um, based on the CT scan. And I think to answer that question, they're really the best answer comes from otopathology. Um, many of the radiologic studies that are done, um, or all of the radiologic studies that are done are really based on just the um, clinical diagnosis. And while we know that that is um, usually accurate, you certainly cannot identify the extent of disease in the audit capsule um, just based on the clinical history. Um, so for example, radiologic studies are based on either just having a, a patient with a normal eardrum and a, you know, absent acoustic reflexes and an airbone gap. Um, or sometimes based on patients who had surgery and had um, some of those uh, clinical um, evidence of, of otosclerosis at the time of surgery to confirm it. Um, so this was a study uh, where we looked at um, our temporal bone specimens with otosclerosis and looked at a control group, and we were able to match the exact section um, of uh, the pathology to the, um, the formatted sections that um, more from the CT scan. And uh, in this study, we don't have the results here, but in this study, um, what we found is that there is about an 80% rate of sensitivity. And so there are some cases in which uh, we can see otosclerosis in the pathology specimens that it's obviously not being identified on the um, CT scan. Sometimes when I've shown these images, people will say, well, the CT scan looks really blurry there, but this is actually you know, what we get obviously in real life. And this is a, a high resolution temporal bone CT scan that was done in the same protocol that we do for our, um, for our, our patients uh, with about a one millimeter collimation. So that is what we get um, radiologically. And so of course there are some cases that are, that are missed um, when, when just using a CT scan to look for either extent of disease or presence of otosclerosis. And so this is one such example where you can tell it's a little bit difficult to see if there's any sort of um, hypodensity, which is how you would see otosclerosis on a CT scan. And in fact, this patient did have what would be considered to be a very obvious uh, lesion of otosclerosis here at the typical location. And looking retrospectively, of course, it looks like maybe there is a hypodensity, but, um, but at first glance, it's not, um, it's not obvious. Um, this is an example with this question of endosteal involvement, and it turns out CT scans, unfortunately, are not that good at looking at endosteal involvement because um, the, it's, it's very difficult to tell if the hypodensity actually extends through this endosteum or not on a CT scan. And so this is one such example in which it appears on the CT scan that there's actually an intact rim of um, normal cochlear bone. Um, but then looking at higher power um, histologically, there's clearly endosteal involvement with that hyalinization process. And so these were the results. I mentioned that there was a 80% sensitivity and this is a little lower than again, some of the clinical studies that have been done uh, probably because of the different patients that were included. Not all of these patients um, uh, from the temporal bone study would have been patients that you would have been um, asking for a CT scan during life versus in the radiologic studies during life. These are patients who are suspected to have otosclerosis. So um, that, that certainly affects the, the sensitivity. Um, but overall, CT scans really are pretty good at identifying otosclerosis, just not, not very good at identifying that endosteal involvement. Um, and some of our more recent work has now focused on using um, CT densitometry. Uh, and so this is using the Hounsfield units um, essentially to take a look at how hypodense uh, a lesion is. And 
what we've done um, with this more recent study is to look at a number of areas around the otic capsule, starting with the anterior foot plate area, posterior foot plate around the otic capsule, this uh, anterior cavitating lesion or apple bite lesion as, as we've referred to it, um, and then looking at a matched uh, otopathology specimen. And in this more recent study, we have found that you can certainly use um, Hounsfield units objectively to uh, either determine the diagnosis of otosclerosis or look at the extent of the disease in terms of um, where the otosclerosis has um, involved, where, where it's involved around the otic capsule. And so um, this is some of our data, it's un unpublished, uh, but what we're showing here is that um, a normal uh, otic capsule, which is called a grade zero in this study, um, has a mean uh, CT Hounsfield unit density of around 2200. So that's quite high, it normally has quite dense bone versus um, what we call a grade one otosclerosis. And that is otosclerosis with um, a small amount of otospongiotic lesions has a uh, much lower Hounsfield unit, so around 1700. And so, um, so I actually use these numbers when looking at CT scans. So generally over 2000 ends up being um, something that we would call uh, non-otosclerotic versus under 2000 is much more likely to be an otosclerotic focus. And so this can be helpful if you, um, you know, don't, don't have the um, luck of having a very experienced neuroradiologist to read things for you, or if you just want to be more quantitative about looking at the CT scans for extent of disease uh, for otosclerosis. And again, this may be helpful in the future as we start to see um, potential medical treatments for otosclerosis in terms of looking at uh, response to treatment. So um, we all in this group love to talk about stapedectomy. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, and in terms of some tips that I think otopathology can provide um, for surgery for otosclerosis. So um, in primary stapedectomy, I'm sure you are all familiar with this, that really is a remarkably successful surgery uh, in that more than 90% of patients achieve a significant hearing benefit with good closure of that air bone gap. The literature numbers are actually around 80% or more for patients who have closure um, less than 10 decibels. I think we're all disappointed when we see a patient who has you know, more than a 10 decibel air bone gap, but the, but the literature numbers are around um, 80 to 90%. And then of course, we always talk to patients about this risk of profound hearing loss, um, which in experienced hands is around one to 2%. And so I, I think that um, otopathology really provides an opportunity to look at um, how we did with stapedectomies. And this is a, we're gonna look at some of the different causes of stapedectomy failures. But um, first I wanted to show you an example of a, a stapedectomy success. So this is a patient who had a very good outcome with closure of the air bone gap. Um, and this is a, a mid medialar section of uh, one of our temporal bone specimens. And it's just painted with toluidine blue. So you can see the, detail a little bit better. But just to orient you, here's the external auditory canal, uh, the middle ear space, the vestibule, the lateral semicircular canal, the cochlea, the internal auditory canal. And um, you can appreciate the malleus here and the um, long process of the incus here. You can see that there's a very nice crimp. Uh, it doesn't form a, a loop or anything around it, just a nice crimp around the, the incus itself. And then there's good positioning of the uh, prosthesis right in the center of the foot plate as you would want it. And it extends probably about a quarter of millimeter um, into the foot plate. And so that is, that is the goal certainly um, in performing a stapedectomy uh, in hopes of closing this air bone gap. And this is an example of what it looks like with our typical specimens with the H&E stain. Um, and one very helpful thing is that in these otopathologic specimens, they um, almost always have a little sheath, a uh, fiber sheath that forms around these specimens. And so um, even if the specimen isn't there um, because of the sectioning process, you can actually tell usually where the uh, prosthesis ended up being based on this fiber sheath. Um, and this also demonstrates how there's a nice seal that forms and why we don't have perilymph leaking out. Um, despite uh, a number of different methods used to seal around the, um, around the prosthesis. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, causes of conductive hearing loss uh, after stapedectomy. And I think those can really be divided into two categories. Um, this table is based 
off of a, a study that Dr. Nadal published a number of years ago, um, looking at pathologically what happens in both residual conductive hearing loss and recurrent conductive hearing loss. And so it's certainly really important to, to distinguish these two categories. Um, and that's why these post-operative audiograms are all very important. We, of course, want to see how patients are doing, but um, and it corroborates the story of their subjective hearing improvement, but it also helps us understand for the future, if there were to be an issue, whether or not it would be a case of residual versus recurrent conductive hearing loss. Um, so in terms of residual conductive hearing losses, sometimes that could be related to just the wrong diagnosis, so a third window syndrome or, or some other diagnosis that was not made in terms of other ossicular fixation at the time of, of surgery. Um, it could certainly be due to some prosthesis issues such as a poor crimp um, or a malposition prosthesis. Um, in terms of recurrent conductive hearing loss, the most common cause is lateralization of the prosthesis. And in those patients, sometimes you can even appreciate the prosthesis underneath the, the TM itself. So if you're seeing something shiny and metal uh, right underneath the TM, that's usually actually a bad sign. It should be more, of course, off in the distance onto the incus. Um, and sometimes this is also associated with erosion of the incus lung process, but it could also be um, that the prosthesis is uh, medialized in the case of erosion of the, the lung process of the incus. You can also get what's called marginalization of the prosthesis. And so, um, that is either due to scar tissue uh, or to, due to the healing at the foot plate where the prosthesis has become lo lodged at the side uh, of the fenestra or at the side of the oval window and so that it's not able to move freely. And then another potential cause is, of course, disease progression, so regrowth of, um, of otosclerosis around the foot plate that's caused um, recurrent fixation there. And so this is an otopathologic example of um, lateralization of the prosthesis. And um, this is an unstained specimen. And so again, here you can appreciate the vestibule here and uh, the cochlea. And here is the stapes prosthesis. Um, and what you can see is that clearly the loop has come off of the incus. Here's the incus here and the malleus here, and it is certainly lateralized. And typically what's happened in that case is that there has been some um, erosion of the incus lung process as well. And so this is one such example, and perhaps I've shown a, a, a controversial method of repair here, but uh, this is one example from my practice in which there was a lateralized, lateralized prosthesis, and you can see oftentimes there's some fibrosis at the site of the incus here, the prosthesis has become lateralized, and then oftentimes the um, foot plate has actually resealed or rehealed. Um, so there's no actual leaking perilymph due to, due to recurrent um, sealing of that foot plate. Um, and there, in this case, there certainly was not a whole lot of recurrent otosclerosis, and it was very easy to penetrate that and to replace the prosthesis. I think the question becomes, um, in these cases, is how to replace that prosthesis. And those options range um, from either rebuilding the incus. And so that's what was done in this case, is some reconstruction with otomimics of the incus and replacement of a prosthesis. Um, to placing the prosthesis higher up on the incus um, with or without some additional otomimics, to performing a um, malleus attachment uh, stapedectomy, which is oftentimes uh, quite a nice solution to uh, these revision cases. So this is another uh, example from our, our otopathology lab. And in this example, um, this prosthesis is actually uh, much too deep. And so as we were talking about before, we typically want that to be about 0.25 millimeters into the, to the vestibule. Um, and this prosthesis is quite deep. In patients who have very deep prostheses, of course, we can get symptoms, um, vestibular symptoms related to that. And in addition, uh, lying in the spherical recess, down in the vestibule is, of course, the saccule. Um, and this is the side of the utricle as well. And so, um, having a very deep prosthesis uh, can also cause um, pressure-related uh, vertigo as well. And so with any sort of um, sneezing or bearing down or external pressure, some of these patients can get a lot of vertigo related to that. And so this pathology example really shows you why in terms of how proximal um, these structures are to the prosthesis that you're putting in surgically.
This is uh, another a different example. And um, in this patient, they clearly had a lot of otosclerosis. And here's the cochlea in this case. And here's the vestibule in this case. Um, and in this patient there, this was not a good outcome. And so they did not have complete closure of the arid bone gap. And um, at least part of the reason was due to this bony spicule that was left behind. And so I think this one image is just a really uh, good reminder of how you know, when making that fenestra, you either want to do it in a way, if you're doing it with a laser, that you vaporize that foot plate in a way that you don't have this trapdoor phenomenon. Um, so working from one side to the other, rather than necessarily working um, peripherally and having this trapdoor phenomenon, it can be very difficult if you do have that issue, because you certainly don't want to take any picks or instruments and start reaching down into the vestibule for concern of um, injuring the saccule here. Um, but this really illustrates why it's important to really clear that area of the fenestra so that you have, a, have an open space um, and an un unobstructed pathway uh, for your prosthesis once it's placed. Some of the other things that we can find um, that would cause uh, persistent conductive hearing loss would be malleus fixation. This is a otopathologic example of such. And um, malleus fixation can certainly make the case more tricky, but, um, but depending on the amount of conductive hearing loss, it may still be worth proceeding. Um, and that could be done in a number of ways, including a um, malleus attachment prosthesis in which you separate the, uh, the malleus head by nipping it and removing it and removing the incus, um, or some would approach that with a, um, uh, with removal of the malleus head and then a uh, torp after opening the foot plate and placing a graft down. This is an example of a biscuit foot plate. Um, this is a challenging situation if you encounter this surgically. And I think this picture uh, is worth a thousand words in, in terms of trying to explain what's going on and the rare chance that you do encounter this in the operating room. But um, but this is a situation in which the foot plate itself is very thick. And so here again is the vestibule, the middle ear, um, the foot plate is very thick and it's thick because there's otosclerosis involving the foot plate. Um, but it's certainly not rigidly fixed in this example to the uh, otic capsule. So here's the otic capsule full of uh, otosclerosis, both anteriorly and posteriorly. And the reason why this is a challenge is because it would be difficult, if not impossible, to penetrate this with a laser with this kind of thickness. Um, and so when you cannot use a laser, um, the recourse is certainly a drill. And using a drill on this would pose the risk of actually um, impacting the foot plate uh, into the vestibule. And so one strategy, if this is encounter a very thick, thick foot plate that becomes mobilized, is to actually drill on the side uh, of the foot plate, um, because we know we have about a millimeter of space before actually penetrating this cochlear endosteum um, to create a little channel and, um, and then allow um, either removal or enough of a channel to place a prosthesis here. Um, and of course, with removal, we certainly don't want to be putting picks again down into the um, vestibule here, but the um, foot plate can possibly be um, removed by creating a little channel like that. So that is called a biscuit foot plate. This is an example of um, round window otosclerosis. And um, one of the concerns with round window otosclerosis is that, of course, you could have complete obliteration. And if you have complete obliteration of the round window, um, performing a stapedectomy is unlikely to close that air bone gap. One of the challenges with these patients clinically, though, is that, of course, it's really not possible to tell, um, in the operating room at least, uh, whether or not there's complete round window obliteration. And so um, typically, um, the way that I would approach that would be to still perform the stapedectomy to see if we could get closure of the air bone gap, but certainly to take note of that, in that this would not be a case that you would take back um, if there was a persistent conductive hearing loss after that. We would presume that it's due to a complete round window obliteration. And we know from some of our work looking at CT and histologic radiologic correlations um, that in cases where the round window is very obliterated, you can certainly, um, whoops, sorry. You can certainly um, tell that on a CT scan, but in, in some of these cases where there may be some incomplete obliteration, actually it would be very difficult to tell that even on a CT scan. Um, this next example of how, is, uh, how otosclerosis can actually be inside the round window membrane. So another reminder of how it can actually be very difficult to tell. You can imagine surgically, if you were looking at this round window, 
Um, and even if you were to use an endoscope and look a little bit more clearly at the, you know, um, oblique nature of the round window, it might be difficult to tell that there was actually otosclerosis behind the round window um, because it can cer certainly occur inside um, the cochlea. So just checking our time here. So a few other questions that came up um, thinking about stapedectomy and revision stapedectomy is this question of what happens with um, stapedectomy in terms of causing endolymphatic high drops. I showed you this case where there was some um, dilation or high drops of the saccule and it even was abutting the prosthesis is one of those cases. And so we were interested in looking more at whether or not otosclerosis was possibly causing the high drops or if it was just the surgery for otosclerosis, the stapedectomy that is, um, that was leading to, to high drops as some of these patients um, do develop actually some Meniere's type symptoms. And so um, we went back and looked at um, high drops uh, histopathologically um, among patients who had um, otosclerosis. And um, we also did a clinical study where we looked at the um, incidence of um, high drops uh, clinically among, among patients. So just showing you the temporal bone study results, um, when you look across all temporal bones, uh, including a control group uh, that we used uh, patients who had had presbycusis, the rate of, of high drops was very low, so about 3%. Um, and when you look across otosclerosis patients who were not operated, that's around 2%, so there was no difference there. Um, but when you look among the operated patients, there was a much higher um, rate of endolymphatic high drops, and that was about 12%. And so there is certainly something about the surgeries that we're doing that predisposes these patients to high drops. And um, when you look at the numbers of surgeries, um, the more surgeries you do, so the more revisions, the higher the rate of high drops. And of course, at the high number of operations, this is just a very small number of, of temporal bone uh, temporal bones that we had. Um, but certainly it does appear that the more revision cases you do uh, on the same patient, the higher likelihood of high drops. And I think this probably has um, something to do with our increased rates, unfortunately, of sensorineural hearing loss um, with, with revisions and certainly with second revision cases. So something to keep in mind when you're seeing that patient in clinic who's got a recurrent conductive hearing loss and you know they maybe only have 20 or 25 decibels of recurrent conductive hearing loss, is it really worth bringing them back to do a revision case because they, you know, they may have some high drops of the saccule and they certainly have, as we know clinically, a significantly higher rate and risk of sensorineural hearing loss with revision stapedectomy cases. And so this is just one example from that study where we're looking at um, a patient who had otosclerosis in both ears. Uh, and in the left ear, it was operated. The patient had had a stapedectomy. And in the right ear, it was unoperated. And you can see in the unoperated here on the right, you can see uh, um, there's really no high drops uh, throughout the cochlea here. And the saccule is normal in shape versus in this operated ear, they developed pretty significant high drops throughout the cochlea and also high drops of the saccule with this, um, with this uh, vestibular fibrosis such that the saccule was actually adherent to the undersurface of um, a membrane, which you would have to open to do a revision surgery on this patient. So in the last um, few minutes here, I thought I would just talk a little bit about far advanced otosclerosis. Um, this is something that that um, comes up, uh, sorry, about far advanced otosclerosis. And sometimes in these patients, um, the idea of cochlear implantation comes up, of course, because they've had progressive sensorineural hearing loss. And while they may have an air bone gap, there is significant sensorineural hearing loss such that um, stapedectomy alone may not be sufficient for, for um, auditory rehabilitation. So in these patients, oftentimes there is a lot of otosclerosis around the otic capsule. Typically a CT scan would be done anyways as part of your cochlear implantation workup. Um, but uh, CT scan pro can provide some of that detail. This is a, an actual patient uh, who had otosclerosis and was gonna undergo a, a cochlear implant. And you can see um, what's called the halo sign or the fourth ring sign with all this hypodense bone around the cochlea. And certainly in preparing for a cochlear implant in these patients, we're most interested in looking at this round window area and you can appreciate all this hypodense bone in the round window. Um, and this is just a reminder of how the otosclerotic bone may be either inside the cochlea or at the margin of the round window. And so being prepared uh, when you see this um, on the CT scan that you might encounter something that looks like this histologically, um, being prepared to do a um, drill out is, is certainly um, important in these cases. 
interestingly, in those cases, oftentimes it's just a small shell of bone. And so sometimes those cases can be less challenging, for example, than somebody who's really got labyrinthitis with a whole lot of bone that's filled the whole basal turn. Um, and so oftentimes it's just a small amount of um, drill out that's needed to get through that little shell of otosclerosis that we were just showing. Um, the, another study I wanted to point out on this is this concept of facial nerve stimulation in otosclerosis in patients who had cochlear implants. Uh, when you look back at these cases um, histologically, we can see that having otosclerosis in the area uh, of the labyrinthine facial nerve as it approaches this basal turn of the cochlea um, causes changes in this uh, bony quality so that there's much more spongiotic bone. And that probably is the reason why there's electrical current that's carried in there. So um, histologically, I think there's a good explanation of why these patients have a higher risk of having facial nerve stimulation with cochlear implantation. Um, and this is also a reminder, this is an image that I think about um, in cases of far advanced otosclerosis when we're thinking about cochlear implantation is this idea that you can have such tremendous cavitary lesions and spongiotic bone from otosclerosis. Like in this example, there's a huge cavitary lesion. Um, and this is a, a photo that uh, Dr. House gave us, I think a number of years ago, which is an interesting reminder of what can happen in these patients in that um, a cochlear implant um, could potentially go through this basal turn of the cochlea if there's a large cavitary lesion because this bone actually may be even dehiscent in that area. So it's a good reminder in terms of thinking about placement of that electrode um, in, in terms of trying to avoid a uh, displaced uh, cochlear implant, um, which could potentially end up in the IAC. So, um, in conclusion, I hope you've learned something that will help with your clinical care of these patients going forward. I think there's a lot to learn from our histopathologic studies. Um, we talked a little bit about pathophysiology and um, trying to understand more about the causes of sensorineural hearing loss. And I think there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. Um, we talked a little bit about the role of um, CT scans and about uh, understanding um, the outcomes of our actions as surgeons in terms of post-surgical um, complications that can occur and how we can do better with our surgeries. And just some acknowledgements, um, really wanted to acknowledge the whole Mass Eye and Ear Autopathology Lab and a number of um, residents and fellows and um, our radiology group who's worked with us on that. And that's all I have, so thank you very much. Thank you.